Check, check, check. Tim, what's up? Whoops, the wrong button. Watching the replay, go ahead and skip this countdown. If you're watching the replay, go ahead and skip this countdown. Friday. From Las Vegas, what's up? Eli, what's up? <laughs> Eli, I see you calling in, but I don't see your image. I don't see your video. I see you now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, all right. You sound good. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. All right. I'm all right. putting my other monitor so I'm not looking down. Hang okay. on. Sounds good. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to tell me, or are we just going to preform it? Oh, no. I mean, I've I put everything in, in, our, in my email last night, and other than that, we're good to go. I mean, I start. I start. I'll introduce you in about ten minutes in. I, you know, I go through some like some clips in the beginning, and then I'll introduce you in about ten minutes in. All okay. right. Yeah, our mics are hot, so uh, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> uh, whoever's there listening, y'all, yeah. you guys are listening. Yeah. Okay, go buy my buff. There you go. <laughs> Be sure to check out Product Led SEO. Zen. 
Don't be shy. Say hi. Where are you from? Glenn, what's up? <laughs> Delilah, I see you. James, what's up, my man? Don't be shy. Say hi. We got about two more minutes. Two more minutes. You guys ready? Shane Kane, what's up? Welcome to another episode of the SEO Video Show, where SEO is alive and fun. My name is Paul Andre DeVera, aka Dre, and I curate SEO videos released in the past week into about one minute clips. My favorite part of the show is when I get to introduce my guest, and my guest this week is the author of product led SEO, Eli Schwartz. Before we get started, let's say what's up to everyone in chat Shane, Zen, Eli, Tim, Glenn, what's up, everyone? Delilah, I see you. Okay, just to um, get along with, just let's get on with this. The contest we do be sure to put i love seo in the chats to get uh, entered automatically we go ahead and pick last week's winners but this week this week i'm doing something different just put i love product led seo and i'm gonna get gift you everyone in the chats the book i love product led, i love product led seo in the live chat and i'll gift you gift you this book at the end of the episode but before that let's go ahead and pick last week's winners all right it's gonna be one month access to img courses Let's check it out. Mm -hmm. 
Ernesto, email me. Animal Nerds, email me. Kenneth Ellis. All right, all right. First one to email me will get access to that. Be sure to put I love product led SEO and you will get a free copy of this book. I will be gifting Kindle copies all day. So put I love SEO in the live chat. Okay, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Now let's get on with the show. This is Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man. <laughs> Why are SEOs good at game shows? They know how to get quick answers. <laughs> John Mueller explains the value of author pages. Let's listen in. What I see on our side is when it comes to things like author pages or information about the author or information about entities in general behind a, a website, an article, or something. Um, what, what happens there is our systems try to recognize who that is, what that entity is, and we do that based on a number of different factors. And uh, that does include things like links to profile pages, for example, or uh, visible information that, that we can find on these pages themselves. So my recommendation here would be to uh, at least link to a common or kind of like a, a central place where you say like everything comes together for this author, which could be something like a social network uh, profile page, for example, and uh, use that across the different uh, author pages that you have when you're writing so that when our systems look at, at an article and they see an author page associated with that, they can recognize, oh, this is the same author as the person who wrote something else. And we can kind of group this by entity. And we do that based on maybe this common social networking profile that is there. Uh, in, I don't know. Long ago, we used to have the rel author annotation, and all of the the older SEOs will probably facepalm now. Uh, but it's something essentially where we try to use structured data to explicitly apply this. Uh, but it is something that like the, the rel author annotations are no longer used at, at Google for quite a while now. Uh, but we do try to understand who the entity is behind an author page. I always tell my clients, so make sure they have other pages for their blog pages just to get the entity tied in. With Core Web Vitals that moved in, uh, that moved to June, June, it gives us a little more time to optimize for our images. Check out these advanced image optimizations from the Authoritas channel. For instance, you should use figure and picture text for setting it to search engine crawlers. They are important. It's important to use some HTML text. And also, please try to use placeholders for your images. And also, you should use source images for different. Uh, screen views or different devices and please try to use decoding async attribute for your images because it will make your cpus or your device's cpus uh, it, it will make it easier uh, to load any kind of image so basically you will save a couple of milliseconds for every image and for an e-commerce site it's actually pretty important about the avid avid is actually a new kind of uh, image extension and it's definitely better than this picture or image jpegs or any other kind of image extensions. Please use Avid, but the bad news is that as at the moment, the software doesn't support that. So that's why actually we need a, a source SRG set or SR set. It's because if you use Avid, sorry, if you, if you use Avid, Safari won't be able to load it. And if you use also JPEG or web picture, Safari can use the second resource. And also you shouldn't use the laser attribute of the Chrome. This might be a little awkward to you, but it's actually not a cross-browser compatibility solution. So you should use a kind of simple intersection observer API for your laser load setup. And also, if you can, if you if you are able to use SYG instead of JPEG, please use SYG or inline images. You can continue. I know that was a lot to digest there, so the link is in the description to check it out. What are some essential things that content teams can be focusing on right now? Focusing on content, <laughs> I know everyone's heard it. It's not news, however. Just think about this, you know, this tips and tricks session, right? We have all these amazing people. They've all given us their thoughts, one minute each pretty much. All of that can be made into social content. We could be converting the videos into transcriptions, using those as key insights. We can turn this whole thing into a blog post. Uh, we can take the slides, put them on slideware. There's just so much you can do with content. You gotta stop thinking about it with blinders. This, this, this is so much work. To, to build even something that's, that ends up being 45 minutes or even a 20 minute presentation, for example. And we forget that like that actually has value. It just, people are gonna find it through their own mediums and methods. 
We should be looking to repurpose content in the most meaningful way. And I think content teams like that. They like the idea of not just being, you know, stuck heads down and we're only writing for the, the website, right? Well, I think that's that's a great idea, right? But it takes a lot of time to do all that. I mean, it's something I should be doing too with uh, the stuff we're doing here. But be sure to check out the whole video on SEO tips and tricks from the C3 2021. You'll see a lot of past guests on there dropping some knowledge bombs. Uh, once you have the great content, it's time to add schema. Martha Van Berkel of Schema App shares many schema tips for a uh, content on the SEM Rush channel. Channel. Let's check it out strong connectors and so when you're writing articles especially like our content or any page but specifically articles i love these properties within schema.org that allow you to be again very specific but also connect to different things and you saw um, i used mentions in my last example so about very you know this, this page is about this like let's be really clear maybe it's you know you're talking about a product and the product's described on another page or you're talking about a person a founder and it's defined on another page it's a really great strong connector property uh, mentions is another one again a softer relationship so about it's very clear this is about it whereas if it mentions you might have one or two things you mentioned there um, and then subject of and has part are the opposite of each other so, um, you know, the example I would give here is like, um, if I was talking about that, uh, maybe it's an article that is about my brand new, awesome, beautiful bike that I just got, I might say it's the subject of the FAQ on the page where I then sort of have FAQ. Whereas if I had a page that was about FAQ um, and it has part, then it would be the opposite. All right. I like to give examples. I don't know about you, but like Friends came out when I was young. It was kind of a big deal. And Justin Bieber's Canadian. So what were the chances that I found an article about Justin Bieber and Friends? Google found it, so hilarious. So Justin Bieber's gonna have a cameo in the Friends reunion, did anyone know this? So I could say it's an article about Friends that mentions Justin Bieber. And then again, if I wanted to be totally nerdy, I could also do a subject of on FAQ. There you go. Make sure to tie in with these strong connectors, the strong schema connectors. Uh, it's a great idea to tie in all your entities. Ted over at SEO Fight Club goes through some field op observations and shows us how high keyword density is still a strong ranking factor. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. Um, I went and looked at uh, Beacon's website for what they're doing, and you know they have you know the plumbing keyword in there, five hundred and fifteen times. That's quite a bit, you know. Uh, I just hear it time and time again from Whitehead SEOs. Keyword stuffing doesn't work. I don't want to put an unnatural amount on my page. Well, they're doing it five hundred and fifteen times. When we look at number 20 for the same keyword, they do it 162 times. They're number 20, they did it 162 times. And we see this time and time again, when we isolate for keyword density and testing, Google literally sorts the pages by keyword density descending. You know, when that's the only factor in play, that's how Google sorts the pages. And we, we see it in the wild, you know, it's, it's a bit more noisy because there are more factors in play, but it's still a potent factor. So if you're a plumber saying, I'm gonna use my keyword a natural number of times for the visible text, let's call that 40. Where should you fall compared to number 20 at 162 and number one at 515? Does your 40 uses of the keyword stand a chance? You know, it might if you have enough off page and other factors. All right. Check that out. That episode is pretty interesting on his field observations this past week. Are you looking to become an SEO speaker? Melissa of Cox Automotive explains how she chooses conference speakers. People that said, I've been in SEO for 10 years. I can talk about anything in SEO. You're out. That wasn't what he needed. What he needed was what can you talk about and what can you teach? Right. So at the end of the day, what matters is that the attendees walk away with information that they can learn or, or take and use and improve something, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can't tell a conference, this is what the takeaways are going to be for your audience. This is what they'll learn from me and how they can apply it and improve something. Whoever takes the time to write all that out has a better shot, if that makes sense. That's really yeah. good to know. Um, it's you, you're going to have 10 or 12 equally qualified people in the end, maybe, maybe just 10, but it, then it comes down to the level of the pitch. I can talk on this topic from this angle, this angle, this angle. Don't just say this, this little thing I can do just like, give us the whole picture. Um, and then, then the takeaways, because, if Brett has, well, you know what, I'm going to start a second session on the same topic from this angle, he knows why well, I can include this person mm -hmm. and talk about it from an in-house perspective or from this perspective. So 
you kind of have to give the conference everything. And I think the biggest fail is people who did not take time with the pitches. Practice your pitches, guys. Do big brands have an edge in SEO? Let's listen in. Well, I'll just close out with my opinion on that, which is I think users like brands. So users trust CNN for news and Uber or Lyft for more than taxis and Mercado for workplace tools. And Google wants to give what users want. And they're not just going to be like, well, I'm going to give you whoever was able to secure the best backlinks or, or write the longest piece of content or have the prettiest images that they give users what they're looking for, which is why we find when like big brands get penalized, it's like a slight slap on the wrist because, you know, people will think that there's something wrong with Google if they can't find in like, there are great examples like years ago, JCPenney and I think uh, BMW got penalized. Like if they can't find BMW and JCPenney and Google and they can find it in Bing, they think Google's broken, not those brands. This brings me to my favorite part of the show. Please, be, please ask questions throughout our conversation as this is a great way for us to learn socially. Let me go ahead and get this thing set up here. All right. Eli is an SEO expert and consultant with more than a decade of experience. He has SEO clients as WordPress, Shutterstock, Blue Nile, Quora, Get Around, Mixed Panels, and Desk, and more. He is an in he was in-house SEO and lead an SEO team at SurveyMonkey. He frequently speaks at marketing events across the U.S., Asia, and Europe. He authors columns published on Search Engine Land, Marketing Land, and Search Engine Journal. He is acted as a judge at the U.S. Search Awards, U.K. Search Awards, and the U.S. Interactive Marketing Awards. He is the author of the new number one bestseller on Amazon, just released this week. Product Light SEO, please welcome Eli Swartz. man how are you doing today it's great to be here that was a hell of an intro i you... could have gone on for another 10 minutes uh, i wouldn't mind <laughs> you bet you bet man you got your number one bestseller congrats on that thank you Man, I mean, I, I know how much, I mean, I, I actually don't know how much, but I know there's a lot of work that actually gets into putting out a book and a lot of time that goes into that. I mean, that's such a great, like a great, great um, um, accomplishment there. So, I mean, how long did it actually take you? Because I know I heard you like talking about it like earlier in the year that you're working on it. I mean, how long ago before that were you talking and like actually working on it? I think I wrote my first word more than two years ago. So I thought this thing was going to be like, you know, I, I met somebody at a conference who explained to me the writing process. He's like, you can you can do a thousand words a day and here's how you multiply it and then you end up with a full book. I was like, I can do it. That, we're talking like six months here, right? Well, it may have taken, there, there were many days I could not write. There were many days that I wrote badly. There's many days I had to rewrite. There were many weeks where I couldn't write at all. And, you know, it took me probably the better part of a year to finally get to a book and I thought I'm done. And then I got to the publishing part of it and I found out that I was not done. So I thought beginning of uh, 2020, I was going to have a book out and now it's, you know, almost mid 2021 mm -hmm. and I have a book out, but you know, it feels better. It's a marathon. I gotta tell you, like I, I've been telling people for a long time, I was writing a book mm -hmm. and many people told me they're writing a book too. And you know what? <laughs> I have yeah. a book. I'm still waiting for theirs <laughs> and I'm still waiting for them to start. It feels good. I'm glad I finally did it. Yes, yes, I love that. I mean, that, that's so, so it's a great, it's a great accomplishment. Like I can mention. I mean, okay, I'm actually curious. This is not SEO related, but um, what does five L E stand for? I saw that as, as your Twitter handle, as those three characters, five L E. So I've always been like a technology early adopter, and I, I live in Silicon Valley. Now I don't live in Silicon Valley anymore. I live in Texas. Okay. And uh, a friend of mine who was a very early employee at Facebook, he was showing off that he had a three letter yeah. handle. Uh on Twitter and I said and this was uh, 2009 and I said okay I think I can find a, a Twitter handle that makes sense that three letter characters there were more of them then and it was the closest I can get to my name so five is is s and I got two letters for my my first name Elijah Schwartz. so like five s and le five so reverse order 
but that was as close as I could get. And, and you know, I stuck with it. And I wasn't on Twitter for a long time. I, my account says it opened in yeah. like 2009, 2010. And I didn't spend a lot of time there. And I've been spending more time there recently because we don't get to see each other in person. So this is, this is the way it's going to happen. Like, you know, networking and engaging and talking and camaraderie on social media. Love it. Love it. All right. Okay. Okay. Let, I want to actually like, like this, I want to go into, um, about, you know, you're, you're talking about like big brands and like, and that one clip we were talking about, uh, I played earlier. I'm curious, let's, let's talk about big brand and enterprise, enterprise SEO. Like, like how does, like, how does someone, you know, get to work with such big brands, um, as an SEO, like whether it's in-house or as a consultant, how do you do it? Luck, total luck, prayer, you know, the right place, right time. No, it's, to be fair, like I'd say, like if I think back about my career, there's mm -hmm. a ton of like being in the right place, right time. There's a ton of luck, and I'm super, super grateful for all of that. You know, like even that I, I you know, was hired to work at SurveyMonkey in, in 2012, resulted in the fact that I had been hired at another company four years earlier by a specific recruiter. And when I was looking for a new job, and I reached out to like SurveyMonkey, that recruiter was now the recruiter at SurveyMonkey. And she essentially got me hired. She brought me to the, the hiring manager and I was hired. And I didn't have that great background. SurveyMonkey was not a startup, but it was a very authoritative company, mm -hmm. you know, big brand. And, you know, they, they hired from the cream of the crop and some great universities that I did not go to. And I was able to get that opportunity. And then by being at SurveyMonkey, I think the world favors big brands. So I was able to speak at conferences. I was able to get columns on search blogs. And that opened up some doors to some great, great companies. And from there, those, you know, working with those great companies and having some of those examples to talk about, I was able to work with other great companies. So I tie that all back, you know, be right place, right time and, you know, keeping at it. Love it. Right place, right time. Just keep going. Keep going. Love that. Okay. So I'm curious, like, so you've been in house and you've been, uh, you know, been a consultant and uh, you're, are you a full-time consultant right now? Yes. I mean, so is this something like, um, like, would you go back to being in-house or do you love being this, having this consultant role? So what I do is I'm more of a fractional VP of SEO. So I work with some amazing companies. I am integrated and embedded within their teams. I am in-house. Now, oh. everyone's going to read my book and, and they're going to get to a chapter where I talk about hiring and who should they should hire for SEO. I'm a big believer in not hiring for SEO because I don't know that there's a 40 hour a week job in SEO. So essentially what I'm doing with the clients that I work with is I'm doing the amount of hours they need for SEO. And they're only paying me for those hours they need for SEO. And it's, it's not an hourly thing, it's a retainer thing. Mm -hmm. But essentially they're breaking down what they might have paid for a full-time person. They're paying getting the exact same output. I'm helping their engineers build the roadmap. I'm helping their product managers build that roadmap and build the products. And that's what I do. So my competition for that kind of consulting, and I know we're gonna dig into this, and I hope we dig into this, <laughs> is not really agency. My competition are other people that are going to do exactly what I'm gonna do, embed with the team. Say for the larger companies I work with, I have their computers, they mail me their computers, and I can only supposedly use their computers. And if they're listening, I don't use their computers. <laughs> they just sit on my, my yeah. bed. But uh, they, you know, I go through their security reviews and I get their Slack accounts yep. and I have email addresses. But I'm only focused on one thing, and that one thing is not 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Now, my competition is not agency because agencies are not aligned with the way that team's going to work. They may be deliverable based. They may say, uh, "Here's your audit." Now, when I work with these large companies, I can't even get them to do something very small on a product spec. And that's one page. I can't imagine what it would be like if I gave them 150 pages of all the things that are wrong that they don't care to fix. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I, I see that. Like, I see that all the time. I mean, um, I mean, and that's actually, and you get to, um, being a consultant, I guess you get to work with like a lot more companies, right? There's no, as long as they're not competitors, do you have some kind of like agreement, like as long as you don't work with them or I mean, is it just kind of your, your own like morale you kind of look at? <laughs> No, I, I talk to them about it. You know, I want to be as open and ethical and transparent as possible. Yeah. Usually it doesn't come up. Yeah. I'd say with the largest companies where I go through those background checks, they specifically call out that I can't do work with very, very specific companies for a year. But other than that, it, I don't even think it matters. You know, for all, everyone's going to read my book and we'll talk a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. Like my belief is on product SEO. So I'm mm -hmm. building products and that's not like I'm not competing on keywords. It really comes yeah. down to what the company is good at. They build their own product. If they're in a competitive space with another company building the exact same product, 
then obviously that's an issue. But if you're in the exact same space as somebody else, but you're focused on a different area, I could do SEO for both because I'm just helping the product team achieve the goals they have. Boom, like it, like it. Okay, uh, I mean, this is also like, just for the, someone that wants to follow in your footsteps, like, like, what would be like a going rate at someone that your level, like, I mean, if you don't mind sharing, <laughs> like, it's, if, it, if not, like, what should like, you know, say you're, you know, very experienced, over a decade experience, you're working with enterprise companies, um, whether if you want to be in-house or even just a consultant, like what's something like, you, like the value of that, that person should be um, making? I think you're asking the wrong question. I'm going to correct that question for you. Okay. So I have seen a wide variety of salaries. When I was at SurveyMonkey, we paid a certain salary to people that I hired on my team. When I worked at startups, I saw the salaries they paid. Now, those salaries were based on some sort of laddering, like, oh, this is a marketing specialist. We'll call them an SEO. This is a product manager. We'll call them an SEO and all those things. And that's the way the salary base are driven. If someone wants to do consulting, they should do value-based consulting. There's uh, clients I've worked with where I've helped them create hundreds of millions of dollars in sustained revenue year after year. So I can't peg myself to, hey, you can pay me $500 a month for this, or you can pay me $50 an hour or $10,000 an hour if I've created hundreds of millions of dollars. When they're bought in, then you can command that. So I would say like if you're working with a auto dealership who's going to sell an extra five cars a month, maybe you can't ask for that much. But if you're going to work with a large business, I love working with public companies because those numbers end up in the Wall Street reports. Mm -hmm. If you're going to work with someone and create hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue for them, you can ask for a lot and you deserve to ask for a lot. So I think that's the right question is like, uh -huh. how do you figure out what the value is that you're creating? And that's, I say, that's why I call product led SEO because okay. you're building a new product and the product's going to have a revenue number attached to it and to be measured by revenue. And when you get that number, you say, well, I'm going to help you build, you know, Within a year from now, we'll have $10 million from this. And here's the price. And it sounds a lot smaller when you say you're right now, you're not doing anything. And I'm asking for money to spend that you're not spending. Got it. All right. All right. You know what? We got to take this back. We got to take this back. We need to learn how Eli learned SEO. So how'd you get into this whole, how'd you get started? Like, take me through the journey of, of a, back 10 years ago, how you got learned it into, and, and that, that journey of all the different companies. So I was at a company called Quinn Street. It's 2006. This was pre-mortgage subprime explosion. Oh, yeah. And this company was a lead generation company. They helped people that were looking to get something that they needed to fill out a lead for. And they were helping companies that needed leads. So mortgage is a great example. I worked in that mortgage space. There were websites that were really good at generating traffic. And there were people that really wanted to get a mortgage that maybe didn't deserve to get a mortgage. I was pretty good at the sales part of it and signing up affiliates. And when I would hit my numbers, I would start reading about SEO and reverse engineering what my affiliates were doing because I found it to be absolutely fascinating that uh, the company I was working for was sending people that essentially, you know, sat in their pajamas all day, which we all do right now, uh, $50,000 per month for leads. And I was like, I, so I asked them, I would say like, okay, how did you do this? And they would direct me to books. The first SEO book I read was SEO book by Aaron Wall, learned right. everything I could about yeah. SEO. I, I learned about Yahoo Site Explorer, reverse engineering backlinks, keywords, and I took that home, started building websites, and that's how I learned SEO. And then I really, really liked it, and and you know that led me to my next role in SEO. So my my next role after that was about two years later, working for a startup, and I'd say like the entire startup model was probably something that would now be called black hat SEO. Well, not black hat, gray hat. It was all duplicate content. It was all buying backlinks. I had a, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month in a link buying budget. And that was all great. We were ranking on all the best terms and then Panda happened and we were destroyed. And that's when I say I went through my transformation. So that was uh, 2010 mm -hmm. of like that SEO can't work because all you're doing is exploiting loopholes and they need to understand the better SEO. And I became, you know, started learning technical SEO. I, I don't think since then I ever bought a link. So you know, coming up on 11 years without buying a link, which nice. is pretty good. Celebrate my anniversary here. But so <laughs> uh, that that is when I started understanding more about like users and search engines and building products. And I was working at a startup. It was very easy to go and, and you know build the right thing for users. And then from there, I went over to SurveyMonkey 
and really learned the product management aspect of, of growing SEO and working with engineers and building for the long term and not following best practices because best practices work when you own the best practices. Best practices don't work when an engineer says, I disagree and I, there's something else I'd like to do. And then you actually have to come up with an alternative of what you're actually going to make happen. So what I would say is if you know anybody wants to get better at in-house SEO, suck it up and get a job in in-house SEO. I am so glad I did that. I Many times I thought about working for an agency and I'm glad I stuck with it and stayed in in-house SEO. And for anybody that is in out in-house SEO right now, you are incredibly, incredibly valuable because you know every once in a while, I probably just did it recently, we'll go on LinkedIn. So using uh, Sales Navigator to get a free trial of Sales Navigator if you've never had it before. Look at how many job openings there yeah. are for SEO and look at how many people have the experience that matches job openings. You know, they're looking for, um, you know, I'll call them out right here. I interviewed at eBay uh, maybe four years ago, got to this final round and the recruiter told me that I didn't meet all the qualifications. The qualifications for the job, well, it was uh, some, and possibly a VP role of SEO. And the qualification was you had to have managed a team of 20, okay? Find me someone, an SEO person has managed a team of 20, <laughs> managed a multi-billion dollar e-commerce website. So I guess whoever's running the team at Amazon if they don't want to go to eBay and um, have 10 years of experience. So I only checked one of those boxes. And I don't think anybody in the world checks all those boxes unless they're a person that is at Amazon. So that's the thing. There are job descriptions that are looking for people that don't really exist and they can, they'll relax some of those qualifications. But if you're in in-house SEO and you have a number of years behind you, you are worth gold. Love it, love it. Come on, SEOs. I mean, yeah, I was right before our, our conversation here, I kind of just looked at LinkedIn and just searched SEO and jobs and there was like over 20,000 results that pulled up. I was like, God, this is like the like the largest amount I've seen so far. Um, every time I kind of I can look back and forth because I, I pr actually created the show just to help SEOs and people get into in-house SEOs. We actually had a question here. Um, we we've uh, by Charles, you had a great interview on the Siege Media podcast about how there's a huge talent gap in the market for SEO professionals. Has anything changed in the past year or so since this interview? I haven't seen the interview. So. Uh, it's got yeah, it got better. I, I, I think you cut part of the interview in there into the, the intro. I think it got better for if you're an SEO and the, their, that job gap has grown. I looked at it during the pandemic. It was not ideal. There were not a lot of job openings. Now I think it's better. And, and the reason is, is because companies are spending more and more money than ever on Google and Facebook on paid advertising. And they would very much like to not have to be addicted to that. And I think they're exploring a channel. And just to call out something I, I tweeted the other day. So I, I wrote the book because I, I want, I thought there should be a book. I, I like, I always would a, try to answer questions. Like someone would say like, what, um, where should I buy backlinks? And I'm like, don't buy backlinks. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. Or like, what should I do? My page speed is terrible. I think I'm screwed. I'm like, no. And I, there was, I didn't have anywhere to point them to. So I'm like, I should write a book. I just want to have this so people can have a book. So that's why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect like there to be so much demand. I knew my friends would buy it and my, all my friends that are going to watch this video. Thank you. I love you. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you buying it, Dre. And I figured I'd sell a few of your books, but I, I'm closing in on over 2000 books. Yes. And that blows my mind. So there is all those people buying the book. There's so much demand for SEO. They're dying to know more about SEO. And if you look at like the books that are sold on Amazon and SEO, they're very tactical. They're not written to those, yeah. you know, executives that are curious about who to hire and how to build a team and all that. So if this is you, if you are an in-house SEO, go to your boss right now and um, ask for a race or go get another job or, um, I don't know, start consulting. Just go on LinkedIn and look at how many people there are like you. You know, if you are in the U.S., there are tons of job openings. And here's another thing to look at, actually, if you're, you mess around on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Look at how many big companies and I'm talking like. All right. So the S&P 500, I would imagine, is most is probably close to 500 American companies. Take any of those S&P 500 companies and look for someone with the title of SEO or look for anybody that is in digital marketing and see if they have SEO in their LinkedIn profile. We're talking like a tremendous amount of opportunity. So these are companies, again, SEO makes sense for everyone. You know, there can be companies in S&P 500 like Halliburton, right? They drill for oil. Don't you think if they can convert one person off of organic, whatever it is they sell, they can make money, right? So these are areas for opportunity, areas for full-time jobs. If, this, if you're in this industry, you stay in this industry, you make a lot of money.
love it love that tip over there i mean dude you're, you're hitting all the spots right here that's that's so good i mean okay i want to like uh before we get into the book we, like i wanted to talk about like how you know when you got a client brings you on and and you know like what's what's the what's the the, the first thing you do like I, I like i mean i want to bring this i want to bring this up over here um you, you mentioned this you know build for the user not the engine and like this is something like you you i've, I've you know so far read in your book i mean, only went to like chapter four so far i got the book just yesterday and but i mean and you were talking about like you know building for the user not the engine and it's, is this something that you just like, so how do you start this when you like, go into a company like when you just start consulting for them so usually they i started it when i sold them on hiring me and you know, again, I just hope the book will be just as helpful as I thought it would be because they, it, you know, it's hard to understand, you know, explain in a 30 minute call what I can do for them. And I'd say, but read the book and then we can talk and then this will make sense. And this is what I can help you do. Or you could hire someone else or read the book and do it yourself. But they many, many times companies don't understand this concept because they understand bad SEO. So they think SEO is stuffing keywords. They think SEO is um, improving their page speed. They think that SEO is, uh, you know, buying links, right? So they, they don't understand and then they'll focus on, and the worst thing I think they do is they focus on keyword research and building content based on that keyword research. So what you have up there on the screen, build for the user, not the engine. I know everyone says that on Twitter, but I, I take it even a higher level, which is, does the user even care for your SEO? Like put yourself in a user's shoes and decide if your business makes sense for SEO. And I, I think that there's not unlimited amounts of money within companies. I mentioned Halliburton earlier, they're an oil drilling company. Should they take money from like their field marketing team and put it into SEO? Probably not, right? But I, I find that many times VPs of marketing and CMOs and whoever's leading this, they just want to check a box. They're like, I need to do SEO. And the first thing I'll say to them before I sell them and before I even consult for them is why? Do you really think people are looking for your business online? And are they looking on search? Or are they looking on social? <clears throat> or are they going to conferences? However it is they're looking for their business, don't spend money and time on SEO if they're not looking for you there. Build for the user. Like, and again, it comes down to it's like creating content. So let's say you're in a car insurance innovation, you have some sort of way of changing and selling car insurance. So you go to keyword research tool and you search car insurance and lo and behold, car insurance is the most popular keyword. So you write a lot of content towards car insurance. But you know, Geico has been writing a lot of content towards car insurance. and. Um, you know, the car insurance aggregators write a lot of car content towards car insurance. Why are you different? You can't mm -hmm. just write content. So if you have an innovation, let's talk about that innovation. And I'd say for anyone that's a startup, your challenge when it comes to doing SEO as a startup is no one's looking for your innovation. You have to create the demand for that innovation. So create the how-to. And the thing I think that's the hardest when it comes to like prioritizing content is sometimes they only build content based on the keyword research. And there's gaps in the content. Just because something does not have a lot of keyword research, does that mean you're not going to write it? So now someone's going to search something, find it on your website, look for some, the next thing, but it's not there. And now they have to go back to Google, and then they go to Quora, and then they go to Reddit, and you've lost them. So write all the content your customers need and your users need, not all the content that search engine, you know, that the keyword research tells you to or that Google's keyword planner tells you to write for the user, build for the user, even just like don't even do SEO if you don't have a search user. Love it. Love it. Okay. So, I mean, that, that goes into like, like how you, in the book you're talking about, it's like you don't really do traditional um, keyword research. Uh, you, you pretty much uh, don't do any backlinking as much and you haven't built, bought a backlink for 11 years now. And the, the and you say that the product should be the SEO driver. Um, and so like, you know, can you talk a little bit more about like, like well, how the product should be the SEO driver? I mean, you were kind of getting into it about how, you know, you're, you, you build the demand for it. Uh, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. So the way I think about it is the, in the way I use the word product is a, is a very broad, broad term, right? So product is a, an asset. It's, it's could be a video. It could be content. It could be a website, it could be a web page, whatever it is. So I, that's, it doesn't have to be something tangible and physical. So the example I used in the book is Zillow. So Zillow didn't do research to decide whether they should optimize for my personal address. What Zillow did is they did research and said there's demand for this market. There's demand for people wanting to understand more about home valuations. So therefore, we're going to build a product, which is this home valuation landing page. And the SEO they did was not on the keyword 
which is someone's address, which there's no traffic for. The SEO they did was an architecture. The SEO they did was on the kinds of content they're going to meld into that page and do programmatically and scalably. So that's what product-led SEO is. And that's what you're building a product for a search user. A product for a search user could be a content library, but it's not scalable. Like, how do you build millions of pieces of content? If you're a news site, the product you're building is news. But your news has to be different if you're building for a search user. If you're expecting people to search, uh, you write the latest um, you know, uh, recap of President Biden's speech. Everyone wrote the latest recap of President Biden's speech. How do you expect your search product to be better? But if you have a specific innovation, which is, hey, we, we have a recap of President Biden's speech, but we're actually writing the recap of like how he moves his eyes or something, that's different. That might be the, mo I can't promise their search volume for it, but right, that's the emotional part. So now you're gonna build the product around that instead of saying, I'm gonna recap the speech and then hope I can convince people to check out our other emotional product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll give a really bad example of, of not doing product-led SEO. I worked with a really large public company. They spent $4 million on a blog because that's the way they, they do SEO. And the idea was they're going to drive all this traffic and then people come to the blog and then they go and use the product. But that's not the way it actually worked. That is advertising. They're building, they're spending $4 million to go and like have an ad, a house ad on this blog and people can click over to the product. Instead, when, what we built was some a content and SEO integrated in exactly what they do, exactly what they sell. So when people were looking for the, the fit of what they needed, the demand of how their product was going to solve their problem, they asked the SEO we created. Not the, oh, let's write for keywords and have a huge blog. That had a great amount of readership. And because, mm -hmm. uh, again, I love working with big companies and you know people leave, because that, that blog did not work out, they threw it in the garbage. Like they threw out all the content because it would have been more expensive to figure out what to do with it and repurpose it. And it didn't work for them. So there went $4 million. No one got fired because it's a big company and that person left anyways. Oh, man. Um, so with, with that, I mean, so that's it's more like how you're talking about like how um the, you know a product led as you know product led SEO needs to have a, a product market fit right it's like if you're trying to um, for those for like even those like with that are, that are like non non techies non startup techies can you explain a little bit more like 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 this this concept of like having a product market fit and tying it in with that product led SEO yeah so product market fit is essentially people want what you're offering and this is a mistake that's not just SEO it has to do with startups. And that's why startups fail a lot of times because they create something and it solves their problem. It solves the founder's problem. Or if you're an SEO person, it solved something you thought made sense, but you didn't solve a broader problem. There wasn't an actual market goal. So when I, the way I apply product market fit to product led SEO is instead of using keyword research, I'm using people. So yeah. you go out and again, we'll use car insurance as an example. So say you have some innovation around car insurance. I'm not going to say, well, I've innovated on car insurance. I made it cheaper or um, I made it uh, faster. I'm going to go out to people and say, if it was easier for you to shop for car insurance, you didn't have to call a, an 800 number and talk to them for 15 minutes, right? Uh, ribbing on Geico here, right? It would it be easier to just do this on a form and not feel like you had to pull out a ton of paperwork and you could do it faster. If you knew that you had product market fit because users told you that's what they wanted, all they wanted was to be able to like seamlessly do car, like buy car insurance and know they're not getting ripped off and something like that, then you build for that. But if you don't know that, if you ask users and say, hey, would you um, buy car insurance, you know, if it what, didn't take you 15 minutes, and I'm like, I guess, I don't know, it makes sense. That is not product market fit. So product market fit, and like I assume Zillow did something like this. Zillow knew that when they created their content offering around people's addresses, that it was needed. There was a demand for that. So that's a product market fit, how you apply it to SEO. So if like, don't just write, a uh, invent a new mount like a better mousetrap don't write you know do uh, create content and say well this, these other pieces of content are 800 words i'm going to double this and i'll make 1600 words that's my seo strategy that is not an seo strategy an seo strategy is saying those other pieces of content do not address the gap that i know my users want i'm going to address that specific gap and i'm not talking about a content gap where like there's a, a gap in keywords i'm talking about a demand gap that there's, some, there's something people actually want. A good hack for this, and my book is all about not doing hacks, but a good hack for this is to go on Quora and to go on Reddit. And I don't, I'm don't, i not advocating stealing anything because it's terrible when like people spend all that time and go on Reddit and write these great answers, and then other people go and recap them on their 
on their website and be like, here's what the top Reddit users are saying, man. They're like, Reddit already did that. I cannot just go to Reddit. So I'm not advocating stealing. I'm saying go to Reddit and look at the problems people are having and they have problems with everything. Look at the problems and say, wow, real users are complaining about this. Real users are writing about this and trying to solve this. What if there's an actual need there? And then try to validate it another way. Now, let's say you're a going concern and you have a big business and you know, I was in this position with Serving Lucky and I've been in this position many times before. And we have a customer support team and we have a Salesforce instance where people write in questions and customer support answers those questions. That's all data telling you what people are looking for and that can inform the kind of content you can create and the kind of SEO channels you can open up for yourself. Dropping those knowledge bombs, corn Reddit, look at the problems and write content around that. I mean, it goes to the part where it's like you're almost trying to like as you're you're going after the want or like the need, like right? Because I mean, you had that one where you don't sell like a teledoc as product, but you sell like the the part where they don't want to make an in person visit, right? So it's like that 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 part where it's like um, you figure out what ahead of time what they want instead of just pushing the product. Love it. Okay, you actually mentioned you want you. We should be move, moving away from the term content is king. Um, and, and you say you move away from content king, but content is, you know, a, a powerful tool in, in the right marketer. Can you tell us like a little more behind like, you know, why we should move away from this uh, content is king? Because be content is king. content becomes content for content's sake. And when that, you know, you go to conferences like, well, content is king, let's just write stuff. Like, so what? So you've written stuff. Does anybody even read it? Do you help anybody with that content? And one thing I like to talk about all the time is I, I, I hope I'm not unique in this. Pretty sure I'm not unique in this. And, you know, people like to Google when they, they have some sort of ailment or something, you know, feels a little off in their body. They Google it to see if they're dying. So that's why there's a lot of content out there. So when content is king, so people write a lot of like diagnostic content and try to get you down some sort of funnel or buy some sort of pill or, you know, go to some sort of doctor or whatever, whatever it is they're doing with that content. But you haven't really helped a user. You haven't done anything different. So dig into why people are Googling for those things. And go by the way, just shout out to Google here. If you look for anything related to COVID, there's not a lot of terrible content on COVID, right? Like when you look for any COVID symptoms, it's Google itself. Uh, there is uh, the CDC, there's um, you know authoritative hospitals. You don't have like shady websites that are trying to market like COVID, mm -hmm. fake COVID vaccines or fake COVID tests, like good, that's great. But on all other medical spaces, that's a huge problem. So instead of like writing content because you know people will Google headache, write content that's different. Write content because you know a user wants it, you know a user's gonna find it and do something with that. So that's what I mean when I say we have to move away from the city of content is king, because like I've worked with teams where their goal was a certain amount of words per week. Why? Like why are they writing a certain amount of words per week? Or why are they writing a piece of content? Or why are you writing an ebook? Is anybody even gonna download it? And if they download it, are they gonna action on it? So uh, don't waste time with content create for the user and the user is who you should write for not for any sort of arbitrary content goal dropping those knowledge bombs okay so i mean this is how far i got into the book where it's uh seo is for humans i mean this is this is uh, when i started reading about it i mean it's great stuff i mean there's one there's one quote that you talk about um you know like hey like, you know, there, there will be certain things like the AI will start like, uh, machine learning and AI will start taking over certain things. But, you know, SEO will still always be for humans. Like you can't beat Google's AI with another AI. Right. I mean, uh, and you have to add a human in the mix. Can you like, you know, I mean, I love that it was actually bolded in the book. And it's like this, this quote makes sense. Can you talk a little more about that quote? Yeah, and, and this is a pet peeve of mine that there's like always these SEO AI tools and yeah, maybe you could do AI on like title tag optimization or maybe you could do AI on like cross-linking. But SEO is not about that. That like, First of all, I think Google eventually is going to get better at title tag optimization that you don't need to do title tag optimization. And I think Google is going to get better at cross-linking that you don't need to do it as much because these are – when you have to optimize your title tag and we have to optimize your cross-link, you're optimizing for Google being inefficient. And Google ultimately wants to be as efficient as possible. So you were a crappy SEO and you're a crappy website and you just didn't get around to cross-linking well enough. Google wants to account for that and say, well, you have awesome content. You answer exactly what the user needs. Well, too bad. You're, you didn't cross-link well enough, so you're just not going to show up in the results. Or like your title title is like almost there, so therefore we're going to give it to the other spammy site. Not a chance. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately we get there. So these AI tools are helping you to like, you know, optimize for Google's inefficiency, but that's not what SEO is about. To me, SEO is about creating content, creating a product for a human user. And AI can't do that. AI can't run a survey and see emotion and um, 
you know, understand what it is that you're creating for. And I want to give a really good example. And actually, give me a second. I want to Google it because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, my computer's tied up. Um, there was a movie that won the Oscars last week. Um, Called, oh, called Promising Young Woman. Okay, so uh, I instruct everyone to go do this right now. Google Promising Young Woman and uh, look at the people also ask. So I'm gonna read them out loud. Mm -hmm. So promise, uh, the, the term I Google was Promising Young Woman. So we have, is a promising young woman on Netflix? Okay, you can optimize for that keyword. How do I see Promising Young Woman? So that is a question which you can answer not necessarily towards optimizing for keywords. What happens in a promising young woman? Now we're moving away from actual keywords. Mm -hmm. And finally, is promising young woman triggering? That's an emotion. People are asking an emotional question. Keyword research can't tell you that. Keyword research can't tell you that that is a, there's something emotional behind that. So if keyword research can't tell you that, AI can't tell you that. AI can't tell you that this is what people want when they search a promising young woman. And I think it applies to everything else. And Google gets better on this personalization. And we've all seen this where um, say you're looking for a new car and you Google the name of a car and okay, you're looking for Honda Accord. So you say like Honda Accord. And then the next thing you do is you put price and then the Google suggests is price of Honda Accord or you Google safety and it becomes safety of Honda Accord or it becomes uh, you put in the word VS and it's like Honda Accord mm -hmm. versus Toyota Camry. That's putting you down a funnel. That's Google understanding mm -hmm. what you're looking for. So that's not optimizing for keywords. And that's why AI can't do that because AI is not going to create those experiences of what well, we know when someone looks for a Honda Accord and they want to know price. Well, no, that person wants to know price. So create, act, create for users and users are always going to change and users are going to get better at knowing what they're looking for. And that's what I think all these devices we have change. You know, the Google Assistants and Alexa and, you know, Apple, Siri, like all these things are helping users to, to be search even more personalized on their own. And you can never account for like the what people want. You know, I, I love like how Google itself and the Google Assistant accounts for like emotion and which is like, is it hot? Right. That's not a query. But Google can say, is it hot? Are you asking, is it hot outside? Is it hot inside? Am mm -hmm. I hot? Right. Like, Tell me how AI can solve that. Tell me how an AI can help solve Google's AI. So you need people. That's why I say SEO is always for humans because we understand what to create for humans. And if you can create AI around that, then that should be a product. Why would you do SEO? Damn! Love it, love it. Okay, okay. All right, guys. All right. Um, I'm coming close to time here. I have one last question, but before I ask my last question, be sure to ask any questions. If you have any questions on enterprise SEO, on SEO strategy, on product led SEO, please ask it right now. And also, if you want to get a copy of the book, I'm giving away free copies, uh, some Kindle copies. I'll send it out to you right after the show. At uh, put, I I love product led SEO in the chat. I put, I love product led. Uh, product led SEO in the chat and I will send you a copy. All right, guys, um, while you do that. So Eli, I mean, I asked this question to uh, all my guests here, um, you, know, you know, before they, before we sign off, it's like, you know, if someone wants to get into the enterprise SEO industry, wants to get, you know, break into this issue, we can see it. There's 20,000 jobs of, like, available right now that have the term SEO in the description. What is your best advice to get this person going? I would say think like a product manager, learn how to be a product manager, because ultimately the bigger the enterprise is, the more challenging it is to get things done. So instead of coming in on an interview, and I know like when I was hired at SurveyMonkey, I interviewed with the CTO and she didn't care about SEO at all. And, and you know, she didn't know about title tags and didn't ask me those questions, but she asked about how I was going to get things done. How was I going to, you know, collaborate? How was I going to elaborate? How was I going to discover things and how was I going to hire those kinds of things? So learn about product management, learn how to become a better enterprise employee that's very good at SEO and don't come in with, I know how to you know rank on keywords and I know how to like optimize title tags and I know how to like find 404 pages. Mm -hmm. You say, I, I know how to make more money for the, you know, out, out of our organic acquisition. I know how to help engineers create better products. Like, that's what I think you should, you should, you know, really highlight for yourself. Hi, maybe, and again, there are many companies have this. Their job descriptions for in-house SEO are terrible. You know, I've seen them. They yeah. uh, they ask you to be good at bookmarking, and they ask you to like, you know, you're good at link acquisition. You know, I even 
I screenshotted one from Google a few years ago and it had some of those things in there. Google's hiring for in-house SEO and they, they could have done a little bit better in their job description. They weren't actually going to hire for any of those things, but they took someone else's maybe. Mm -hmm. So come in and, and teach them. That's what they're looking for. So if you can, the hardest thing obviously is getting an interview. But if you can get that interview, explain how you're going to be the best team player and not how you're going to get the best keyword rankings. Excellent. Yeah, I actually highlighted that thing, uh, that that passage in your book where it's like you actually have to learn like internal politics and just like being able to understand the internal business uh, will make you like the, the great team player that you are. And and you know that was some great advice there. Okay, I didn't see any qu uh, questions come in here. Um, I am um, there's. Uh, I'm gonna. So that's. I mean, that's gonna wrap up the show here. But I want to go ahead. If there's any anything to for this to make the episode complete for you, I mean, uh, how can people find you? Uh, please, the stage is yours. So, of course, the number one thing you should do is you should buy my book on Amazon, uh, Product Led SEO. It is, uh, it, you know, doing well, and I appreciate everyone buying that. You can also check out the website for my book, productledseo.com, which Wix was so kind to help me out with designing and building. And my own website, elishwartz.co, uh, not .com, but you can Google me and you should find that and that accounts for that. And then finally, my favorite social network is LinkedIn, but I'm also on Twitter, so LinkedIn, again, you search me. And then Twitter, my handle is 5LE, and I'm happy to connect with everyone. And it, it's you know, truly, truly an honor to be here. You know, watch a number of your shows. You have amazing guests, and you know, I'm happy to be considered amongst one of those amazing guests no thank you thank you very much for being part of my being part of the show i mean i know i reached out to you for you and then and then we had to reschedule but i think it rescheduled at a perfect time right when your book came out um so i i thank you i appreciate you uh can you hold on for just maybe one one minute while i sign off here and so i can talk to you sure. like okay thank you thank you all right guys all right, guys, that concludes another episode of the SEO Video Show. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to get notified for next week's episode. Um, till then, I'll see you next week. Peace out. Thank you for watching. Hope you come back next week. Make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a thing. Hope you learn something new because the vibe is incredible. From the special SEO professionals, SEO video show. Let's work. Want to see you be an SEO expert. Paul Andre DeVera helping you step it up. No delay right now. Time to level up. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe. Woo!